So today I want to welcome the two Rays from the Xerces Society. We have Ray Morans, who is our grazing lands pollinator ecologist, as well as Ray Powers, who is our farm bill pollinator conservation planner in Nebraska. So thank you both for joining us today and thank you all for being here. So I will pass it on to Ray Morans to get started. Thanks everybody. Uh we came up with the idea for this webinar, uh, really Jennifer Hopwood, uh, our boss, came up with the idea for this webinar because of course we were all stuck at home quite a bit. Working at home busily, uh, we couldn't get out to places where we normally like to visit, but we could get out to our gardens. So we are taking advantage of this and really spending extra time in our gardens and, and thinking about mistakes we've made and how we can make our gardens better, uh, both for our families and for pollinators. Uh, so uh, yes, I want to acknowledge Jennifer Hopwood, uh, shown on the left. Uh, she's our supervisor, and uh, she is uh, the main author of this presentation. And, and Ray and, and uh, I are both working on it as well. The Xerces Society, what do we do? Well, we are a nonprofit organization based in Portland, Oregon, and we protect the life that sustains us, uh, in our case, with a heavy focus on invertebrate life. Uh, that's why we were created, to save the invertebrates, the insects, the spiders, the freshwater mussels, things like that. Unfortunately, uh, many invertebrates, particularly insects, are declining in diversity and abundance. Many of you have probably seen newspaper articles or articles online showing the abundance of various invertebrates going down. And indeed, we're studied the diversity, abundance, and biomass of many insects and other invertebrates are decreasing. Uh, very famously, uh, the species on the right, the monarch butterfly, has experienced very, very major losses in, um, in abundance, uh, especially west of the Rocky Mountains, where it's declined by over 99% in the last, um, last uh, 30 years or so. And then that species on the right, a bumblebee, uh, it has is gotten quite rare, and at least 25% of our bumblebee species in North America have declined. This is a huge problem, both for people like us who love pollinators just because they're wonderful creatures, but it's also a big problem because pollinators, like other invertebrates, help run the world. The function of pollination that they provide is so important for agriculture, but also for the health of our native plant species and for all the vertebrate wildlife species that feed on them. Um, this slide shows us some major groups of pollinators. So on the upper left, we've got, a, a, of course, the butterfly, tiger swallowtail. And then moths are also important pollinators. Wasps can be important pollinators. In the lower left corner, looks like a bee, but it's not. It's a fly. And many of our flies are important pollinators as are some beetles. And then over in the lower right corner, bees. Uh, as a group, the most important uh, insect pollinators. What can each of us do to help pollinators? What can we do? What is the single most important thing we can do? Most important thing we can do is create habitat that meets their needs. Luckily, their needs are not that complicated. They need food, for instance, uh, butterflies need host plants. That caterpillar that you see is a, is a monarch caterpillar and it's eating its host plant. Uh, adult butterflies often eat nectar and then many bees and other pollinators eat nectar and pollen, nectar and or pollen. Uh, our pollinators need shelter, including nest sites, overwintering sites, and they need safe haven from pesticides. That's extremely important. Uh, it would be a shame if we go to a lot of work putting out plants for our pollinators uh, and have those plants get uh, sprayed with pesticides. Uh, another issue, uh, very sad, is that sometimes the plants we buy from stores have already been poisoned uh, with insecticides uh, at the nursery. So we have to uh, be careful about that. So yes, all of us can create habitat that meets their needs. Where should pollinator habitat go? Now this slide shows uh, urban or suburban area. I need to mention first that Ray and I do most of our work, not in urban or suburban areas. We focus our work on farms and ranches in the central US. So certainly if there are any farmers and ranchers on the line, uh, we strongly encourage you folks uh, 
uh, agricultural producers to put pollinator habitat wherever you can. But for those of you in the cities and the suburbs, uh, putting pollinator habitat wherever you can is also uh, a wonderful thing you could do for pollinators. And it's really very fun. So the, 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 really the purpose of the slide is to show you the variety of plantings that you can do for pollinators. You can plant fruit trees. Many of our fruit trees uh, have uh, wonderful flowers that produce pollen and nectar. They need pollinators and the pollinators need them. Same with our vegetables. Tomatoes, for instance, of course, have little yellow flowers. They need bees to pollinate them, typically, and the bees love tomato pollen. Also, flowering shrubs, you can plant them. Shade-loving flowers, you can put a little piece of prairie or meadow in your property, so on and so forth. You could even plant, uh, have, your, have your city plant a flowering median that's uh, shown in the lower center of your screen. Or you can convert part of your lawn to uh, to bee habitat, bee and butterfly habitat. Gardens are extremely important to this. Our small spaces can support pollinators. They provide floral and nesting resources and support butterfly reproduction. Wild bees, by the way, not just honeybees, can be abundant and diverse in cities and urban gardens. In fact, uh, flower strips in Munich, Germany that are only one year old attracted one third of the bee species found in the Munich area. So that's, that's a nice example of how quickly your gardens can feed pollinators. Here's another example of the incredible power of gardens. This rusty patch bumblebee is the first bee to ever be listed as an endangered species in the lower 48 states by the federal government. That's a very important, very important landmark. This bee used to occur in a very broad area of the north central and northeastern states, but it has declined dramatically in the last 30 and 40 years. So it did get listed, I believe, in March 2017 as an endangered species. It's doing very poorly. But uh, I'm happy to, even though it lives in rural areas, I'm happy to say that new populations have been found recently in gardens in suburban and urban Madison, Wisconsin, and Minneapolis. Yes, people with small urban lots putting in some flowers are providing habitat for an endangered species. That never happened with bald eagles uh, or peregrine falcons, things like that. Putting, putting in gar gardens can make a difference. One thing you can do is try to replace uh, as much lawn as you can with gardens. We have many, many millions of acres of lot turf grass in, this, uh, in North America. It's the single largest irrigated crop. Unfortunately, as the image on the right shows, lawns support far fewer pollinators, far fewer beneficial insects. So the circle is showing that turf grass supports very, very few plant species. The object of most people is to have a single species, their, their, their grass, and very few things eat that grass, maybe grasshoppers, and then there are a few predators that feed on the grasshoppers. However, if you replace some of that lawn with gardens, you're going to generate a much more complicated food web, an entire ecosystem with a variety of plant species, many insects that feed upon the various plants, and many predators that feed upon the insects that feed upon the plants. So gardens can create diverse, diverse ecosystems. We encourage you folks very strongly to try to use native plants in your gardens wherever you can. Native plants support greater numbers of pollinator species. These, they also better support vertebrate wildlife. How? Well, it turns out that uh, research uh, has shown that native trees support four times as many herbivorous insects uh, than non-natives. So if you've got trees like oak trees, for example, native oaks that have lots of caterpillars in them, you're gonna have birds coming to your oak trees to feed on those caterpillars, birds like chickadees. So research has already shown that planting native trees can enhance the habit, uh, enhance abundance of uh, wonderful native species like chickadees. Using native plants also helps create resilient plant communities, plant communities that can handle drought. Uh, our native species tend to be more drought tolerant uh, than exotic species that bring, we bring in from elsewhere because the native plants have evolved 
with uh, the, the, the local climate. So the more drought resistant, maybe more cold resistant, depending where you are. I, I don't have a, a bullet here to mention it, but also the native species are much, much less likely to go out in the landscape and cause a problem. Uh, one of the most famous uh, exotic plants that has become invasive is kudzu. A lot of people have heard of kudzu as a vine in the southeast. I've seen it cover entire forests. You can't see the trees anymore because they're covered with a mat of kudzu. When you plant native plants, that's not going to happen. Uh, finally, uh, native plants help us achieve multiple conservation goals, like reducing water use and reducing fertilization. When you choose your native plants, we hope you choose some host plants for butterflies and moths. By the way, most butterflies and some moths are very specific in their needs for host plants. And the most famous butterfly in, in the North America is the monarch butterfly. And many of you know that the caterpillars of the monarch only feed on milkweeds. Uh, milkweeds are in the genera Asclepius, most famously, but also Sinancum, Punastrum, and Matilia. And these are the only things that the caterpillars will eat. So if you want to help monarch butterflies, a wonderful thing to do is to plant milkweeds. But additionally, by planting milkweeds, you're not just helping monarchs. You're helping so many other species because the nectar of many milkweeds, most milkweed species, is highly valued by butterflies in general, by honeybees, by, other, by various native bees, including bumblebees, but also by predatory insects like lady beetles, things that feed on, on pests in your yard. So um, I always start with milkweeds. Uh, any garden I make, that's the most important plant that goes in it because it's so multifunctional. A very, very important principle of native, gardening with native plants for pollinators is to provide plants that are blooming at various times of the year. Actually, we hope that that blooming is constant from spring until fall. So on the left, left side of the slide, we show plants that bloom in the spring early spring, and then just to the right of them, uh, lupins, and I think those are blueberries, blooming a little bit later. Uh, then toward the right side, we've got milkweeds and thistles blooming in early midsummer, and then way over to the right, some uh, asters and probably goldenrod blooming in the fall. It's really, really important to have overlapping bloom times because your pollinators aren't gonna be around for just a week or two. They need food for the entire growing season. Another important issue is the issue of native versus native ours. Uh, a native R is when they take a native plant and they uh, are selecting it for very fe various features that make it attractive to humans, but not necessarily attractive to pollinators. So the photo on the left is a purple coneflower, uh, a native type. And the photo on the right is a purple coneflower native R. It's, it's been, been bred to be, be white. And uh, it may actually be pretty good for pollinators, but it may not. There's a chance that it won't be. So, so we suggest you stick to the natives. Um, uh, people are doing research on this topic right now with various species, but the default, our default suggestion is try to stick with the, the, wild, the native wild type species because it's, the pollinators uh, have evolved to use that species. Okay, uh, Ray, it's your turn. I will stop sharing so that uh, stop sharing my screen so that Ray can share hers. Awesome. Thanks so much, Ray. Um, and I think Rachel has a couple of questions for you as we kind of switch off here. All right. The first question for you, uh, you did not mention a water source as a resource needed for pollinators. Is that important? Uh, I'll go ahead and pick that one. Um, a water source doesn't hurt. Uh, it, it would be a great thing to have, uh, but I know most, most of the gardens I've had did, did not have a water source. Um, luckily, of course, pollen, I'm sorry, not pollen, but nectar uh, ha has, has water in it. So to some degree, our pollinators are getting, uh, getting some water from the nectar they imbibe. Um, I happen now to live on 10 acres with a pond, and yes, indeed, I see some pollinators from time to time going to the edge of the pond to get water. So if you can add a water source, 
that is a nice addition, but uh, I would say not absolutely necessary. All right, we'll save the rest of these questions for the end if you wanted to get started, Ray, with the, an AE. <laughs> yeah, definitely. <laughs> Thanks, Rachel. Thanks, Ray, that was um, so awesome. Um, okay, well, I'm Ray Powers and I'm here with you live from Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, and although, as Ray mentioned, I work primarily with farmers and ranchers um, using farm bill programs. I myself live in a city <laughs> um, and have been putting native plants into my landscape for about five years now. Um, so today is kind of a co collation of a lot of our knowledge about um, native plants and using those um, in our landscapes, in our yards, and in our gardens. Um, I want to preface this by saying that although uh, many of us on staff are enthusiasts and or experts in plants and insects, um, we're not landscape designers. <laughs> so some of these tips might seem pretty basic, but um, a lot of them were kind of universal when we started talking about things we wish we'd done differently. Um, so these are coming from people with pretty intimate plant knowledge that made kind of similar mistakes. So hopefully we can help you avoid some of the common mistakes that we made and um, highlight some tips that should help you if you're using native plants uh, in your landscape. So this first tip is uh, probably the most important one and encompasses kind of a lot of mini tips within it um, and that is to know your site and to know your plants. Um, I have an architect friend who said if he was ever going to build a house, he would buy the property and, and live on it for a year, whether that was a tent or just kind of visiting every day to see what the site looked like in different seasons and, you know, how the clouds moved over, um, move over the space. And I think that's kind of would be really nice if we could do that in our garden spaces too. Um, just spending some time in those places before we ever start moving new things in so that we understand how that space looks in different seasons. Um, and know, you know how much sun exposure a certain spot gets that might change throughout the year um, or what kind of soil types we have, which can be a little bit tricky. Um, so here in Lincoln, I deal with what I would call pretty heavy clay soil, um, but Ray Moran's laughs in the face of that designation as you will see in a couple of slides um, with his clay soil in Oklahoma. Um, so that's one thing that I deal with. Um, and when I talk about people getting to know their soil type or learning about their soil um, on their site, I always get a lot of questions about soil testing resources. Usually the first place that I point people to is their local extension. Um, some of those do in-house soil testings, uh, but more often they will at least have kind of a reference or a resource pointing you to local or regional soil testing labs where you could take a soil sample, um, send it in, and then get a report back on your soils. Um, local extension might also have some broader information about um, general soils in your area. So that's just a good place to start. Um, here in Lincoln, to get a soil test is about $15. So it's usually not too expensive or too onerous to get that tested. Um, so that's something definitely to look into. Um, and kind of the last component of knowing your site is definitely understanding how moisture moves on, on your property. Are there places where it pools frequently, places where it's always running off, places that are always really dry um, or always really moist that can help you kind of match your plants to your places. Um, so uh, these photos here, this beautiful blue flowers are a bottle gentian, um, simply gorgeous prairie plant. Um, and that top photo on the right is my bottle gentian, <laughs> the last of three that I purchased and put in that has been clinging to life for a couple of years. So that soil looks really moist because it had just rained when I took the photo, but that spot is just, it's simply too dry for bottle gentian. Um, to near a downspout, I thought it would be wet enough and it's not. So um, we'll address kind of how to deal with some of those mismatches um, if it's still alive <laughs> um, later on in your landscape. And that bottom photo comes from our colleague Jennifer in Omaha. Um, you can see that bare spot. It's kind of the northeast corner of her yard and her house shades it for a solid six hours a day. And she said she's put in multiple part shade plants, just like feeling really optimistic that they might be able to make it with a couple hours of sun. Um, and it's now it's time to move to a full shade plant for that space. Um, so we are all guilty of kind of making that same mistake in our place. 
the second part of this um, know your plants there's a ton of online resources that, that I use and I refer to people to learn more about native plants in their area, um, especially for kind of the Midwest Great Plains, the Missouri Botanical Garden has a plant finder. Um, that is an awesome tool because it has all those details you want about how, how tall the plant is, what kind of moisture conditions it likes. Um, and then they usually also have a little paragraph that kind of highlights how it does well in your landscape. So it might say, oh, this is a great border plant or, you know, a native ground cover. So I really appreciate that um, about the Missouri Botanical Garden Plant Finder. USDA Plants is kind of a big online database hosted by USDA. So you kind of have to know what you're looking for when you go there, but it does have some really basic information about native plants. Um, what I like there is there's uh, a map that you can zoom into actual county level to show where plants are native. So if you're wondering if something is native where you are, um, USDA plants is a good place to go to. Um, probably the, the best resource on this list, if you have it, um, are your local native plant and seed growers. Um, so these are going to be people that are growing native plants, whether that's for a nursery or for seed. Um, it's not going to be going to your nursery at Walmart or Lowe's, um, but someone that's actually working in production of native plants, they have a huge well of knowledge and they're often more than happy to share that. Um, kind of in that vein, Prairie Moon Nursery is a native plant nursery in Minnesota. Um, and they also have a website that has a ton of information on all the plants they carry, which is hundreds of native plants. Um, pretty relevant for most of the Midwest parts of the Great Plains um, and even further east. Um, Intermountain West and West, they don't have a lot of that information. Uh, Xerces also has regional plant lists and a, and a ton of other information on our website, but we do have these regional plant lists for pollinator plants, monarch plants, and um, coming up we're going to have um, some nesting plant lists um, that are regional that are kind of nesting plants for bees and other insects that I'm pretty excited about. So look for those coming soon. Um, one of the resources that I've um, been appreciating lately has been kind of local or regional Facebook or other social media groups. Um, if you kind of tool around and look for, for native plants or sustainable landscapes is another keyword. Um, there's just great groups of people that really appreciate native plants and insects um, and share some really good information there. Audubon has a native plant database called Plants for Birds where you can just um, plug in your zip code and it'll spit out a list of native plants for your area. Um, the National Wildlife Federation has a similar plant database online. Um, and finally, <laughs> if you really want to geek out on native plants, I would totally encourage you to seek out your state-based native plant societies. Most states have a native plant society. It's a little tricky now in this pandemic, um, but usually there's field trips and lectures and lots of dorky people who are just really excited about plants. So check that out if you wanna, want a good time. <laughs> Okay, so here are some of our successes when it comes to knowing our plants and our sites. So a health strip is usually that oh, tough place between the sidewalk and the street. Um, we don't have a sidewalk at my house, but that little first few feet right by my street does tend to be a really tough area. It's high, so it stays really dry. It's south facing, I get a ton of sun, and I do see some traffic through there. Um, but I put in a lead plant, which you can like maybe barely see in the corner of that photo, and it's just doing great. So lead plant is a really tough as nails prairie plant. It's super drought resistant, and it's responded really well to that spot. Um, that second photo is, is some Jack in the Pulpit, if you see those kind of distinct three leaves there. Um, and I put that near my downspout because that's kind of a, a woodland, likes moist soils species, um, and I've got a nice shady downspot area. Um, so that's doing really great. It started a nice little colony of Jack in the Pulpits. Um, so if you've got a downspout, put some moisture lovers there, great place for your rain garden. Um, and finally, if you're lucky enough to have a water feature, um, you can tell from that red soil, that's Ray Moran's in Oklahoma, he's so lucky to have a pond. Um, there's just a range of native plants that'll work. So from plants that will actually, you know, they're pond dwellers, they'll live in your water um, to right at that edge that gets kind of wet and dry throughout the season and to dry upland. 
So this is really just an example that there's sort of a native clamp for every situation. Um, you just kind of have to match them up correctly. And I'm gonna let Ray Morans tell this soil story here, if we still have you, Ray. Am I unmuted? There you are, I hear you now. Very good. Um, yes, indeed. Uh, I need to get rid of something with blocking my view. Um, yeah, uh, on the left, you see a photo uh, of me holding some of my soil. Uh, I mentioned before uh, that we moved on to 10 acres a few years ago. And I didn't check out the soil beforehand. And in areas, we have a very, very, very nasty, heavy clay. Uh, you can see on the right that almost nothing was growing in that clay. Uh, now, Oklahoma has many native species that have evolved to handle living in, in heavy soils, but even most of them couldn't handle this poor soil. So um, a mistake I made initially was trying to plant desirable plants in there. Um, and I wasted a lot of time and, and I wasted some money. So I, I came up with a new solution. Uh, Ray, could next slide, please. Uh, I'm not seeing the next slide. There you go. Um, my solution uh, was given to me by a client, and she told me about hugel culture beds. Basically, you create a raised bed uh, with, with wood at the bottom, and you end up getting some wonderful soil down the road. So um, these photos show an area, that, that same area along the pond that has horrible red clay soil. I piled on some wood, some leaves, some compost, some topsoil. I planted it up on May 22nd. And uh, last week, a week ago, look at all the flowers that were there. July 9th, that photo on the right, lots of native wildflowers and also blueberry bushes. So uh, that's a garden where I'm combining uh, native flowers with, uh, with a food crop. So uh, it's been very successful um, and in this year of the pandemic, I've got a little more time on my hands on the weekend to, to do this, this heavy lifting. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Ray. Um, sort of the next common theme that we all noticed is that um, tall plants need a little bit of extra attention and love and thought um, when you're placing them in your landscape. Um, you definitely want to think about how you and others will use the space. So um, places like driveways where you're getting in and out of vehicles or unloading groceries, <laughs> your walkways, you know, where does your postman walk through the yard? Um, also those common areas near your mailboxes or your front patio, your front door that, yeah, delivery people are coming to, your friends are coming to the door. Um, how do you use those spaces? Um, this photo on the left is a double faux pas for me. Um, that's a pitcher sage, which is uh, again a lovely native prairie plant. I mean at this point I hadn't moved out of my landscape beds, so I planted it under a red bud um, near right on the side of my driveway. Um, so one, that pitcher sage is leaning into the driveway to get that full sun that it, that it really does need. Um, and second, I planted it right next to the edge and that's commonly a place where we're getting in and out of the car and shutting the car doors. So every year without fail, I finally get those beautiful purple flowers and I shut them in the car door and they just peel off as we drive away. Um, so that was, that was a mistake. <laughs> Don't do that. Um, you also have to think, especially for um, tall plants that get pretty big and bushy, um, you have to plan for the shade that are created by those tall plants um, and put the right plants next to them. Um, and they can also provide a really visually striking scene in winter time. So here's a, oops, there we go. Here's a couple more of um, Ray's mistakes. <laughs> Don't be like me when you use tall plants. On the left there is a lovely elderberry shrub, um, which I know all about and I planted it, you know, a mere foot and a half from my driveway um, in an area that, yeah, we drive through to get to the garage. So I'm letting it kind of go wild this year because I want those elderberries this year to, to fight off colds, um, but it will get uh, pretty severely trimmed back after I harvest those berries. So we'll see what happens. Um, this photo on the right has a couple of plants I just love, um, hyssop 
and figwort, which are really, really nice native plants. And they're actually pretty sturdy. They're, they're staying upright. They're not moving into that space um, in front of my front door. But when they bloom, they attract veritable swarms of solitary wasps and native bees, which I sort of love walking out my front door, you know, to leave the house and seeing all of those lovely pollinators. But I do sometimes wonder if my delivery people are a little bit put off by, yeah, the clouds of insects that they need to walk through to, to drop something on my front patio. So I don't know if I would move those because I do really love them. <laughs> um, you can use tall plants as a screen. So this is uh, Jennifer's yard and she's done a good job of putting those tall plants up so she gets some privacy in her backyard. Um, so they can be really useful in your landscape. Finally, they can provide, um, you know, both beautiful um, plateaus in winter, but also winter resources. So this is, um, again, Jenny's house and those windows are actually her home office. Um, and those white plumes you see are joe pie flowers. Um, and in the fall, those will form seeds. And she loves leaving those over the winter um, because the birds will come and visit that to, to pull those seeds off. And she's got a nice kind of bird central right in front of her office windows. Um, I put a couple of Indian grass in my front yard and uh, the first year they were there, they were getting really big, really beefy, and I'd kept mostly short plants in the rest of my yard and I was thinking, oh, I've made a mistake. Um, but that winter, I just, I fell in love with them. They, they stood out amongst the snow. They really made my front yard a place I wanted to look at. Um, so, you know, don't give up on those tall plants. They can definitely go in the front yard too. Um, one other thing that we've noticed is that plant growth um, in your yard might surprise you. Um, for us here in Ray and Jennifer and I and the, the Great Plains and other staff in the Midwest, we're dealing with prairie plants who usually have a lot of competition. Um, so when they don't have competition and they're in our really nice moist garden beds that maybe get watered, um, they tend to get a lot taller than we're used to seeing them on the prairie or even in the woodlands. Uh, so that's a golden alexander on the left, which has gotten to three to four feet and is flopping all over the place in my front yard. Um, I'm not used to seeing that plant that tall and I'm also used to it having supports on all sides being rid of all the grasses around it. So kind of learning how to use that plant in my landscape um, a little differently. And then we have mountain mint on the right with Jennifer's son there that's well over three feet tall, which is um, not how you usually see it in the wild. Another great example is bee balm, which is used a lot in yards and landscaping. Um, on the left there is bee balm in a prairie situation, um, doesn't get super tall. Um, and then over on the right uh, is Ray's bee balm in his, his yard, um, his estate. <laughs> That's frequently watered and he said it's over five feet tall, maybe over six feet tall. Um, so just kind of be prepared for things to maybe get quite a bit taller than you were expecting. Um, one nice thing about native plants, they're usually really tough um, and they actually tend to prefer really poor soils. There's less weed competition in those poor soils and um, I love this story from Jennifer in Omaha. Um, this little spot right, right on top of that sewer grate um, had been worked on by the um, street crew. Um, and nothing was growing there. They couldn't get sod to establish. Um, and then just from seed from their nearby prairie plantings, all of these native plants kind of sprung up and made their home um, in that really poor soil. Um, and I think that's just fabulous. Um, another component of that um, is that you can trim them back pretty brutally and, and they'll be fine. Um, once they've gotten established, they've got a good foothold, those perennial plants can handle a lot of damage. Um, so the sidewalk here, you could cut those plants back pretty drastically. They'll be fine, they'll come back, they'll probably even flower. Um, a lot of our native plants are used to um, getting taken by grazers or browsers, having some of that foliage removed. So um, don't, don't be shy. <laughs> um, and also for a lot of plants, you can move them if they're not doing well. So that bottle gentian is a perfect example of a plant. I should get a shovel out there, um, you know, get a nice soil around that root and move it to a happier spot. Um, a lot of native plants will survive that move. Um, but some plants <laughs> really don't like to be moved. Um, and mostly these are our perennial plants that are long lived. They have a really large tap root. You're gonna have a hard time getting to the bottom of that root. They're not gonna be happy when you move them. 
Um, so these are things like Arsilphium, so compass plant, rasin weed cup plant, um, Baptisia is another group that doesn't really like to be moved. Um, butterfly milkweed also has a large taproot and can be a little fickle about being moved. So those are also species when you're putting them in a the landscape, you kind of want to think long and hard about where you're putting them because they're going to be there for a while. <laughs> um, as, as Jennifer said, she likes to think about if her grandchildren would appreciate that plant in that spot. Um, other plants are kind of nomads, um, which is, it's fun to see in your landscape. Um, and they'll kind of move around and find their own spot. Uh, so on the left there, you see that big, I think that's cup plant, um, which Jenny did not place so close to that stone walkway there. It was, you know, three to five feet away, but it really liked the shade provided by the house and the little extra moisture draining off of her porch and just popped up right next to the walkway there. That's where it wanted to be. Um, over on the right, we have a passion flower from Ray's yard, and he said this has moved, you know, 15 feet surrounding the initial passion flower. He's got new passion flowers sprouting up and it's kind of moving around. Um, and he's really actually happy to have all of that because it helps feed the Gulf fritillary caterpillars, which is that um, gorgeous butterfly in the center. So he's going to keep tons of that passion flower around to feed this beautiful butterfly caterpillar. Knowing your prolific seeders, um, so things that produce a lot of seed can be super awesome in your landscape um, or they can be kind of a pain. <laughs> um, so here are two that we love. Uh, Self Heal for me is like one of my absolute favorites. Um, it produces a lot of seed and it, it just tends to spring up in different places around my yard and flower, um, but it's not overly aggressive. It doesn't push other things out. Um, it'll actually even grow in my sod. Um, so I kind of try to mow around those spots when I notice them. Um, pale cone flower is another one that's been popping up, um, which is just really lovely and uh, the bees love it. So it's a great one to have popping up. Um, Ray, do you want to talk about golden crown beard? Yes, I do. Yes, I do want to talk about golden crown beard. But before I do, I want to say I wish I had pale purple cone flower popping up all over the place. That's, that's pretty awesome. I've, I've, I've planted a few. And for me, uh, for some reason, they're, they're, they're just hanging on. Uh, but one plant I have that does a lot more than hang on is, is this plant shown here, golden crown beard, verbicina and celioides. This is a, a plant in the sunflower family native to the southwestern and south central United States, maybe as far as, uh, as northern Kansas. And somebody sent me seeds, well, a woman named Sandy Schwinn in Tulsa sent me seeds 15 years ago for free. And now I've had thousands of these plants over the years. I don't have to plant it anymore. It just comes up. And I love that it just comes up. Uh, this photo is showing my walkway from my driveway to the compost pile. And, and it's lined with these yellow or golden crown beard flowers, which happens to be a fantastic uh, draw for pollinators. And I don't have to spend a dime. Uh, thanks, Ray. Yeah, here's some of the photos of this plant. And it attracts almost every butterfly species around here, as well as almost every bee. That bee on the right, I believe, is, is uh, Bombus pennsylvanicus, which is becoming rare. It's a, becoming a rare bumblebee in Oklahoma. So I'm very pleased to have these flowers. And again, I haven't spent a dime on them. So um, uh, it, it can be handy to have prolific seeders sometimes. But other times, <laughs> not so much. Um, so brown-eyed Susan has one that's been super persistent um, in our landscapes. And um, it's lovely. Pollinators really like it, but it just seeds everywhere. It does tend to push things out. Um, so that photo on the right, Jennifer said, at least half of those seedlings are, are brown-eyed Susan. And this was after extensive weeding by her in that bed to try to kind of keep that tame. Um, so that's a good candidate for something called deadheading where we kind of let those species flower. Um, and as they start to form seeds, you just kind of go cut those seed heads off and dispose of them so they're not creating new seedlings all, all over the place. Um, aggressive species, um, you kind of also want to use sparingly. Um, so some, some that we've dealt with, um, a lot of the sunflowers tend to be a little bit bossy. Um, so false sunflower will kind of pop up in a lot of different places um, and tends to get pretty big. Um, common milkweed is another one that um, it's, it's pretty tough. It'll survive in a lot of different situations and kind of come through in a lot of different places in your yard. Um, 
which it's sometimes nice to have a whole lot of common milkweed. Other times, you know, you're trying to get something else established. Uh, you don't really want it shading it out. Um, so you kind of have to be aware of where you're putting it and that it's going to move around. <laughs> Sawtooth sunflower. I love it. It's great. Um, so that is kind of the back side of my fence that you see. And that is, gosh, probably April. So now they are taller than my fence. Um, and this initially I planted on the other side of the fence <laughs> um, just two years ago. And so now there's a probably about five foot by five foot patch of sawtooth sunflower on the front side of my fence that grows probably about 10 feet tall and blooms. It's gorgeous, but they have migrated now under the fence and are making a patch in the back. So I have to mow right around those and keep them mowed short to kind of keep it from taking over my whole life. <laughs> tall thistle is another one that's really lovely. It's a lovely native thistle. Pollinators love it. Um, and you can see those tall thistles kind of on the left side um, in my front yard. And all of those red circles are new thistle seedlings, <laughs> uh, which I don't don't want a yard that's just tall thistles so I, I also keep those mowed um, to kind of keep those seedlings from becoming a huge patch of, of thistle. So just kind of being aware of those things and sometimes you don't know it beforehand and you find out you know through trial and error that oh man this this is kind of a lot. <laughs> but uh, being willing to, to manage those um, it's kind of something you sign up for. Um, Okay, so I want to talk kind of practically about a few things and show a few different ways that you can kind of go about including natives in your landscape. Um, and I would say one of the, the things I tell everybody is really to, to slow down and take your time and, and start small. Um, I think it's really fun to see new plants grow in your landscape um, and it can get a little overwhelming, especially in the spring with all the plant sales. <laughs> um, but slow it down just a little bit. Um, one of the first things I recommend um, if you're able is to just mow less, mow your yard less. Um, if you're letting those grasses get taller, um, hopefully you've got something in your yard that will bloom, um, especially if you've stopped using herbicide. Um, in my landscape, that means I get dandelions, I get common violets, and I get white clover in my yard um, when I don't spray herbicide. So if I mow, um, about every couple of weeks, that usually gives the white clover an opportunity to bloom throughout the season. My violets bloom um, quite a lot during the springtime and the dandelions will put up heads in the springtime too. So even by, you know, just not doing something, you're providing resources um, for, you know, groups of pollinators. Um, my neighbors don't always love that. <laughs> this is the boundary of my my yard and the next door neighbor's yard. So you can see he's got just Kentucky bluegrass and um, I've got violets going strong, but that's a good way to get started um, and start seeing more bees and other insects in your landscape. You know, if you um, aren't able to mow your yard, get less or you don't have a yard, um, a lot of native plants will do just fine in pots. Um, they'll even overwinter in pots. Uh, it's a little bit of trial and error. I always get questions about what species do well in pots and um, I don't have a lot of experience there. Um, Jennifer said um, a lot of the sunflowers and goldenrods she's done in pots and not had a problem. Um, but, you know, even native plants in pots are, are definitely habitat. Um, and they can also provide nice accents even if you're doing a whole yard transformation. So um, this is kind of the story of my front yard where I just started plugging things into my sod <laughs> because I didn't want to go slowly and I didn't want to do really distinct sort of patches of habitat. Um, so it's a bit nutty, but I actually really like it. Um, and if I'd stuck to my original plan where I kind of carefully planned out the mowing path, um, and had the right widths between my native plants, uh, it would be uh, even nicer, but I got a little excited and I put things in kind of willy-nilly. So it's a little bit of a maze to mow now, but I was actually surprised how well it did and how, how easy it is to kind of maintain because that sod keeps the rest of the weeds out. Um, and it's just that little area where I put the plug in that gets disturbed. And um, this is a photo of a bunch of plugs of native grasses, which I'm now adding kind of to my landscape because I did mostly flowers that first year. Although there's the three Indian grasses right in the front that I just, they were so gorgeous over the winter. Um, here's kind of a more uh, traditional way <laughs> to do it, which is to kind of take your garden beds that you have and um, maybe convert them or add to them over time. So this is um, our colleague, Emily May. I think she's in Connecticut. 
Um, and she's just gradually kind of increased that border area and has been adding new plants over time. So you can see kind of the edge of where she put in this spring and now here's the new um, size of her landscape bed there with native plants. Um, finally, another method you can use is to actually go through and just seed your whole front yard. So actually kill out your sod, your lawn, um, and then seed in a new habitat. Um, this method, particularly, I like to tell people to start small because it's, um, it's a lot of work. <laughs> it's a lot, a lot of weeding, especially in the first year, and it's kind of a steep learning curve because you need to know what what is something that you planted that's growing that new seedling or is that a really nasty weed that I need to take care of right away. Um, so this is uh, from, from, from some friends of mine in Lincoln who started doing their front yard um, and they did kind of a cardboard cover to kill off that grass in the spring of 2017 um, and they did a plastic cover on their house strip which was was more effective than the cardboard um, and then they tilled the area and added seed um, so this was the second growing season um, on the right there, summer 2018. Um, the first growing season was pretty ugly, pretty weedy, and they spent a lot of time weeding, but um, it looked pretty good by summer of 2018. And this is this year now. I think it just looks so fabulous. They've added some kind of um, mulched pathways through it, um, and it, it really looks good, but it was a lot of work. Um, so that's another method you can use. And I think Ray Moranz is going to take it over and show us one more yard transformation. That's right. Uh, I'm, I'm unmuted. You, you can hear me. I, yes, can, we can, can hear you. Hear you. Me, Ray? Yeah. Very good. I'm going to share my screen. Get back to it. And this should be it. Yes, indeed. And I'm sharing and we will slideshow from current slide. Okay. Do you see the R transformed by Jessica Cruz? Yes. Very good. Jessica K. Cruz is a colleague of ours, a pollinator ecologist with the Xerces Society in Sacramento, California. And over on the left, uh, upper left, you'll see what her front look, yard looked like before she started her plantings. Uh, down below, you see how she transformed the front yard. Uh, it's pretty gorgeous. Uh, and then the photos in the middle and the right, you can see what she did to her backyard. She took uh, an area of fairly unattractive turf grass and uh, made it pretty glorious. I have to say, I don't have any gardens that are this neat and attractive. Um, mine are, are, are large and not as well organized, uh, not as beautiful as, as Jessa. So I'm really impressed by her work, really inspired by it. Um, we have some uh, other tips for what you should do in the garden. We ask you to leave your leaves and save the stems because the leaves and the stems provide habitat. The leaves uh, are really important overwintering habitat for beetles, for butterfly caterpillars, for moth caterpillars, things like that. So if you can leave at least a thin layer of leaves in your garden, that's a good idea. You could even consider putting uh, leaves in your vegetable garden. It uh, provides habitat and also helps protect the soil. The stems are really important for stem nesting bees. I, I saw in one of the questions, somebody asked about uh, nesting plants. And nesting plants are plants that have wide stems, stems that bees can burrow into, native bees. So uh, the photo down at the lower center, you see um, a, a, a beautiful little bee has crawled down there and is making, laying eggs, making nests. So the plants that are best for this are plants with pithy or hollow stems like cane berries. Cane berries are things like blackberries and raspberries and, and a variety of other plants that you see there. Uh, sunflowers are a great example. Uh, annual sunflowers, a very wide stem, it's pithy. Bees can burrow into that and make nests. So we ask you, even though it's not the prettiest thing in the world, we can't deny it, to leave your stems over the winter. And then in the spring, uh, prune them down to eight to 24 inches and then the bees can burrow into those. Other habitat that you can have in your garden are logs. Now in this case, uh, Jennifer uh, shows her yard with just a single log in it. It's fairly, fairly hidden, fairly, fairly attractive. Ray and I uh, like to go wild. We, 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 so here's a photo from Ray's garden showing a full wood pile. 
and that wood pile is uh, going to provide more habitat uh, for bees and for various beetles and, and other pollinators. And I have wood piles like this and large bins of leaves that I just leave around the property. Uh, they're not the prettiest thing in the world, but they provide habitat. When you can, uh, in some situations, try to reduce mulch because many of our bee species, about 70%, nest in soil, so they need bare ground. Now this slide shows you a lot of bare ground, probably more bare ground than there, that you're typically going to have in a garden uh, in the north, in, in the east, where it's wet. This, this looks like more photos from, from the dr uh, dry parts of the west, um, but uh, this is excellent, uh, excellent habitat for soil nesting bees. These are photos, I believe, from Ray's garden, showing that just little bits of bare ground in your garden can help. So you can see little little patches of brown. That's enough bare ground uh, in a in a garden in Nebraska or Oklahoma or or New York or Georgia, or for bees to build nests in the soil. We ask that you tolerate some damage from herbivores, and I've uh, I've learned that it it rarely pays to control pests. Because usually, with most insect pests, there's going to be some other insect that comes and eats those pests. That's, that's bullet number two. Many insects eat or parasitize our pest species. If a pest is really, really bad and your native predators aren't controlling it, consider going out there and, and using your hands, which I, I do every year. I squish lots of bad bugs with my fingers, and no harm comes to me from that thus far. But if that won't work, if that's unfeasible and you feel you really need to use chemicals, um, please try to find chemicals that are very targeted and reduced risk and I'll only spot treat. Xerces Society does have publications online with some advice on uh, organic pesticides. Many of those, many organic pesticides will poison our pollinators. So you do have to be careful even with organics. Uh, that's why we ask you to try to avoid chemicals whenever you can. One fun thing about gardening is sharing plants. This uh, shows Jennifer has dug up a bunch of plants from her garden. She's got too many of them. She's gonna share with her neighbors. Uh, this photo, uh, these are Ray's. Ray, do you wanna share about this? Sure, I'll just be pretty quick. Um, I like collecting seed <laughs> um, and actually starting things, for, things from seed and kind of sharing them with friends. Those baptisia were some seed I grabbed in a prairie. They'd been in my fridge and or my garage for about two years and this year I just decided to throw them in a pot and it was maybe 10 seeds and I've got six bac baptisia coming up. So um, it's really fun and exciting too when you grow things from seed. And really a good way to get a lot of plants <laughs> for not a lot of money. Yep. Look, those baptisias look great. Thanks. We ask folks to spread the word about your native plant gardens. You can get signage um, uh, from various uh, organizations, including the Xerces Society. Uh, also get involved in community science, organizations like Bumblebee Watch or builds community support, work with your neighbors, your schools, your cities, to develop pollinator habitat in urban gardens on your uh, high schools or your university campuses. And consider becoming uh, a bee city. Ask your city to become a bee city if it's not already, or a bee campus for your, for your college or university. Okay, now to talk about resources, additional resources. The Xerces Society has produced a bunch of books on pollinators. We're quite proud of them. The, the one on the right's on on predatory insects primarily, but the others are about pollinators, bees, butterflies. These are gorgeous books produced by my colleagues. We have many, many documents that are, in our opinion, quite useful, and they are free downloads from Xerces.org. Xerces.org is our website. Go to that website and you'll be able to find resources like these. We have dozens and dozens of different documents, guidelines on how to help pollinators. I, I think we can't forget to mention these plant lists. Go online to Xerces.org and download these free lists for every region of the lower 48 states. Plant lists, uh, what you see on the left is for monarchs and on the right is for pollinators in general. Uh, and inside it lists about 24, 25 plants that are great for pollinators. We have a YouTube channel, Xerces Society does, and this 
this webinar will be posted on that Xerces channel uh, probably in the next few weeks. Please connect to us via social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, at Xerces Society. Final thoughts. I want to make the big point that I made earlier. Everybody can help pollinators, whether it's a few pots on your patio um, or a uh, a uh, small garden on the side of the house or 10 acres or whatever, it, it all helps. Uh, it all helps all our pollinators and the work that I've done uh, in, in my gardens and my, my land on helping the pollinators has rewarded me so much. Donors make it possible. We are a nonprofit organization. Without the help of donors, the Zerci Society would not exist. So we encourage you to become a member today at xerces.org slash donate. We need to acknowledge our many supporters, most importantly, of course, the Xerces Society members, um, but many corporations and uh, various governmental organizations have supported us, and, and, and some of those are listed here. And we very much thank them for their support. We have many partners. We don't work in isolation. We, we, we need lots of help. We've got over 12,000 members in 15 countries or more. Scores of private foundations provide us funding. We work with more than 100 scientists at universities around the world. We work with dozens of agencies, and we've been working with hundreds of farmers and man land managers to help them build habitat. Over 50 companies have supported us and thousands of people have been uh, working with us to build pollinator habitat and protecting invertebrates in their neighborhoods, and we thank you all. With that, uh, we'd like to take questions. All right, thank you so much. Just so everybody knows, we are gonna go um, about 20 minutes over time to answer questions today. If you have to leave us now, know that these questions will be included on the recording on our YouTube Channel, and that should be up by Saturday. It's my job and I try to get them out quickly. So hopefully we can get that up soon. And I also wanted to mention that we have an evaluation that automatically pops up as you leave this webinar. We appreciate any and all feedback. Okay, so lots of really great questions. Thank you all so much. So Ray Morans, it looks like you wanted to answer this question. We have a few people asking specifically about monarchs this year, Eastern monarchs. So this person lives in Connecticut and they haven't seen a single monarch this year, even though they have lots of milkweed. Have Eastern monarchs suffered a huge population drop this year? If so, why? Last year they had many. Uh, yes, I'm happy to answer this. Last year was, last summer was a particularly good summer for monarchs in the Northeast. The Northeast was the area of the country where monarchs were, abnorm were, were, were higher than they had been in previous years. This year, it's the opposite. So I've seen many, many reports of people in the Northeast who haven't seen a single monarch yet. Uh, but in the last few days, I'm seeing reports of people seeing their first one. So uh, be patient. Uh, it's very likely that they will show up. Uh, but yes, it does seem like something's going on this summer. Uh, perhaps uh, there's not a lot of success on the breeding grounds in the Midwest and uh, not, not as many moving to the Northeast. Uh, we do know that this past winter's population was down quite a bit from the year before. So, uh, um, but yes, others have noted this issue. It, it's hard for us to understand what's causing that. Um, but uh, but keep, keep, uh, keep posted. Um, we, we might publish a, a blog on that sometime in the next few months. Okay, thank you. In addition, um, kind of in the same line with pollinators specifically, or sorry, uh, monarchs specifically with milkweed, some folks are having issues with keeping milkweed going. This particular person has planted it, but it keeps dying off. They have tried different varieties. Some will grow for a while, but not make it through the winters. Others die right away, while all the other plants in the garden are doing well. Do you have any experience with this? I pressed the wrong button for me, my apologies. Uh, yes, I've got a lot of experience with growing milkweeds. And uh, this question is tough to answer given that I don't know where this person's from, but I'll, I'll do my best. Um, 
the good news is that is that there are over 100 species of milkweeds, um, and every state in the lower 48 has milkweeds. And it's likely that wherever you are, there's going to be at least one or two species that are somewhat easy to grow. Uh, but sometimes they can be a little tough. Uh, the, in the north, central, and northeast U.S., common milkweed is the most abundant milkweed. Uh, that one tends to be fairly easy to grow, uh, but something that stores typically don't sell, uh, except for native plant outlets. But that one typically is easy to grow in the north, central, northeast. Butterfly milkweed is very broadly distributed. It's the one with bright orange flowers, very broadly distributed and more available than most milkweed species at stores, but it needs really well-drained soil. So if folks are trying to grow butterfly milkweed and their soil is not very well-drained, they're going to struggle. I struggled with that for years in my uh, previous garden. And, and finally, I learned I had to create raised beds with, uh, with a lot of sand in them. Uh, in the southeast, I recommend Asclepius perennis, uh, white, uh, which is also called uh, aquatic milkweed. Not the easiest thing to find, but very easy to grow. That's anywhere from uh, Oklahoma to Texas to, to uh, North Carolina to Florida, uh, Asclepius perennis. Uh, out west, I apologize, I have not become an expert on the, uh, I, I, on the milkweeds of California uh, yet. Uh, oh, I know showy milkweed, uh, Asclepius speciosa, is one of the easier ones to grow out west, Asclepius speciosa. And I believe Asclepius fascicularis is, is pretty good as well. Okay, great. So this question is a good one and quite a few people had pesticide questions, but how do we make sure we choose untreated plants at the nursery? And along that line specifically with neonicotinoids, are those harmful? If people have accidentally gotten a plant that has been treated with neonics and they put it in the ground already, should they take it out? Lots of questions. So a lot of places um, you can call and ask about their you know pesticide use for their nursery um, especially if it's a more local nursery um, it's easier to get an answer to that question although even um, even like Earl May um, is usually very responsive if you ask them about their use of neonicotinoids um, so it is possible to get that information and usually kind of the smaller the place the easier it is to get the information and more likely that they're not using those pesticides for growth um, so neonics are systemic so they're throughout the entire plant so um, anything that's eating the leaves or the stems is going to get a dose of that um, and it also even is in the pollen and nectar of the plant so, so bees will experience that neonic if they visit the flowers um, and it can be really detrimental um, for a lot of insects. Um, yeah, it's an insecticide. Um, if you've bought a plant that was treated with neonicotinoids um, and you've already planted it in the ground, um, I think there's, there's a couple of things. I would definitely cut the flowers this year. Um, and so at least you're kind of preventing that exposure to bees and other flower visitors. Um, but you probably want some of that herbage to grow so that it gets established. So some of your leaf eaters are probably gonna be affected this year, um, but just minimizing by cutting the flowers would be my recommendation there. Did I get those all those <laughs> questions, Rachel? Yes, you did. <laughs> oh, great, thank you. So this is a good question. Um, what pollinator plants would you recommend for shaded areas? And maybe that's regionally. <laughs> yeah, definitely <laughs> regionally appropriate. Um, yeah, for my area, some of the ones that I showed, um, the Jack in the Pulpit is really lo lovely. There are some um, golden rods that do well in part shade. Um, also, so really like the figwort and the hyssop will do pretty well in part shade, even to, to pretty heavy shade um, are a couple of really lovely ones. Wood mint is another one that does really well and has a lot of blooms. Um, what else, Ray? You got any other suggestions? Um, well, what I want to point out is that we are going to have a series of webinars this fall, right, Rachel? Regional yes. webinars uh, on this uh, on uh, attracting pollinators 
to your garden uh, for each region. And, and that will be able to give more details on the plants uh, for shade and sun for, for each region. Thank you for mentioning that. Yes, we've heard feedback from folks that they want more regionally specific information. So we will be doing eight different regions and talking not just with gardening and yards, but also at a city level as well and promoting these cities. So um, be looking forward to that. That will start in October and run through January. We'll have more information about that probably by September. So we have a few more really good questions here. So specifically to the hell strip, um, can you give names of plants that self sowed into the hell strips and thrived? Um, okay, so yeah, that photo was, yeah, Omaha, Nebraska. So it was definitely um, little blue stem was the, the major grass that sowed right into that. Um, I bet a lot of the gramas would also do well. Side oats grama, um, blue grama, hairy grama would also probably do fine. Um, that was also an aster there. Um, and any of the asters that are um, kind of dry species would do good. I wouldn't put a woodland aster, but a lot of the prairie asters would do well. Heath aster is known to be particularly drought resistant. Um, I think there was also the false sunflower that had sowed into kind of that hell strip that Jenny had. Um, really a lot of the things that do well in, you know, well-drained prairie soils, so upland prairies would do fine in hell strips. Um, and yeah, just kind of look to what is native to your region that does well in kind of dry, dry environments is my best tip. The next question is about trimming. And people are, fo folks are asking when is the best time to trim um, plants that are still blooming? Um, I guess what, so trim back, like they're just kind of in, in your space or in your way. Yeah, and I think prompting to, so that they don't go to seed, but if okay. they're, in, and bees are still visiting. Yeah, um, so for a lot of plants, there's kind of a point during the flowering that it looks a little bit raggedy and it's not, not looking so good. It's not getting as much visitation. So kind of from that point on, um, before the seeds are mature, you can cut it any time. Um, so for me to know that a seed is mature, which this will kind of tell us a little bit about seed collecting too, is if you're able to get the seed out of there and you can crush it between your thumbs, um, and it's, you know, kind of milky or it puts out some moisture, um, that seed is not ripe yet. Um, so that's a good time to cut it because you don't want that seed to ripen and start dropping if you're trying to deadhead for kind of control. Um, so yeah, kind of when that flower's starting to look a little bit rough um, to when that head gets really dry and brown and hard. Oh yeah, you guys are throwing some really nice shade plants in the Q&A, geranium maculatum. There's a couple of great geraniums for shade. So we have a couple questions about the soil testing that you mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. Are there home tests for soil that you would recommend or DIY soil testing kits? Yeah, I don't have a lot of experience with um, home testing kits. I don't know if you do, Ray Marans. Yeah, I, I'm not I sure have no what's experience on the market. I have focused more on soil texture, which is pretty easy for me to see rather than uh, soil nutrient contents, which is what those kits are, uh, main reason for those kits. Thank you. So a follow-up question to the neonics. Do neonics remain in a plant after the first season? That's a tough one. Uh, I would assume some, of, some amount of neonic probably does remain in the plant or the soil, just because we're seeing additional studies where we're finding neonics in a, a ton of places um, that are you know, near farms, but also far away from farms that use neonics. So we know it's pretty persistent in the landscape in a lot of different ways. Um, but particularly in the single plant that was treated, you know, I'm not sure about that one. That would be a good Jennifer Hopwood question. 
Uh, and Ray, quickly, yes, I, I heard on a, on a webinar this week, there, there are studies showing that the neonics can persist for a few years. Uh, obviously, the percentage, the uh, amount of it goes down each year, but sometimes it will persist for multiple years. In the plant? Yes. Okay, good, thank you. So I like this question because, you know, obviously some folks do have backyards, some people have as you call it, an estate, Ray, <laughs> where you have quite a bit of land. But for folks who might live in an apartment complex or in a dorm and they really don't have an outside area, what can they do to really contribute to pollinator conservation or even, you know, how can they be an advocate um, for those maybe that do have that outdoor space? Do you want to start with that one, Ray, or you want me to start? Uh, uh, Go ahead, go ahead and t tackle that one, Ray. <laughs> so um, I would say definitely get involved with your community, whatever that is, if that's your, you know, your city council or um, asking if you could be a bee city or if that's your college campus and kind of inquiring into how they're making landscape decisions. Um, I think that's one way that you can kind of positively advocate for that. Um, also, uh, you could volunteer. Xerces has a volunteer program um, where you could do outreach um, talking about native plants and guiding people towards the light of, of native plants and um, allowing insects in their yards and their spaces. And I think that would be kind of where I'd recommend starting. I don't know if you have anything else. Uh, that, that all sounds great to me, right? That's, that's what I would talk about. So we are getting some comments just about soil testing kits that they can be attained from your local land grant university, um, from some local nurseries, as well as the county extension office um, also provides those. So those are some ideas. Thank you guys for. Um, Good. Yeah, I know our extension doesn't do soil testing, um, but if your extension does, yeah, definitely. That's a great resource. Yeah, that's where I usually have people start, but yeah, ours doesn't. So, and I don't think um, Omaha's did either when Jenny checked. So it's just kind of a, got to check in. So a few people recommended the Lady Bird Johnson Center as a resource for natives and Ray, it looks like you wanted to comment on that or both Ray's maybe. <laughs> I should have included that, that one. That was an oversight on my part. Uh, uh, being closer to Oklahoma, uh, living in Oklahoma, being close to Texas, uh, I've had the pleasure of being visiting the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center a couple times. And yes, I use their website almost every week. It's fantastic. So again, that's the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center based in Austin, Texas. Uh, their website is a wonderful resource for learning more about native plants in the U.S. Thank you. Is providing winter season blooms just as important as those in the spring to fall? Let me have a stab at that one. Yeah, you can have that uh, one, right? <laughs> 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 I've never anywhere where winter blooms exist. <laughs> That's right. Where Ray, where Ray lives, there are no winter blooms. It's too cold. Uh, where I live, there, there are no winter blooms as well. So I, I, I suspect this person who typed this question is, is from, the, from the deep south or maybe California, the West Coast, perhaps California, Oregon. Um, many, even in the warm weather places, um, many of our pollinators do go, do go dormant in the winter. Uh, but, but um, you know, they, uh, having, having flowers in the winter can't hurt. Uh, it, it can be nice for some of our uh, things that do come out uh, in the winter time. So um, yes, if, if you're in an area with a really long growing season that does include the winter, having some flowers then uh, uh, would be a nice aspect of your garden. So someone did ask about leaving the leaves because they don't wanna disturb the critters. At what point would they be able to pick those leaves up? Is there a safe time? Should they just shove it into the corner and leave it there forever? What would be your recommendations? I think it's a little bit of a balance. So um, definitely one strategy is to rake those leaves into a landscape area where you don't mind leaving them over the winter um, or even, you know, forever. Um, but some leaves do take a long time to decompose and you don't want to kind of choke out um, all of your plants in that little area that you've moved the leaves. Um, 
So when you, when you shred them, um, you're probably killing a lot of the insects that live in or around the leaves. Um, so waiting definitely until um, early spring, mid spring, um, hopefully a lot of those cre creatures have emerged, but they all have different emergence times. And additionally, some early season insects that have now emerged this spring might be moving into those leaves. Um, so yeah, it's kind of balance of when to go ahead and, and shred those and move them. Um, it's, it's tough here, I would say probably mid-May, I would wanna think about shredding leaves and moving them out. Cause I would think a lot of the early season things have emerged and at least those guys were able to, to have a life. So it probably varies. Okay. So this next question is maybe for you, Ray, with an E. Um, what are your suggestions for controlling taller plants that do not have propped plants around them? How do you know which ones can handle being hacked back and successfully stunted? Yeah, that's a great question. And I would say I'm not, uh, I'm not an expert on that. I would say trial and error. <laughs> um, I don't think you want to, you know, kill off your taller plant. So maybe try on half of the plant and cut it back pretty severely one year and see how that kind of does on that half. Um, and if it's going to rebloom. Um, but I think trimming and the timing of trimming to make sure you still get bloom is a little bit of a tricky question and can be species specific. Um, and some things will actually bloom more vigorously when they're trimmed. Um, so I guess my answer would be to just give it a try, see what happens. So I like this question because I think it's something a lot of people probably um, struggle with, but can you suggest any grass alternatives? And of course, this is very much a regional, a regional question that will probably maybe be more suited to the presentations in the fall, but if you have any suggestions um, for your region. Um, the, the most popular alternative here where I am is buffalo grass. Um, so I'm assuming kind of a sod alternative, but that is a native species. Um, but that does require really well-drained soils um, and it doesn't like wet. So you can, it can be kind of patchy. Um, I know that a lot of the native plant nur nurseries do um, kind of yard alternative kits, um, which are usually kind of cool season native grasses um, and also usually include sedges. Um, and those are designed to, to grow tall. You're really only supposed to mow them once or twice a season. Um, so I would look into if you have a, a regional native nursery, see if they have one of those kind of lawn alternative mixes. They're gorgeous um, when they get the you know long wavy leaves, um, just a little different than what I think most most Americans are used to for a yard, but definitely gorgeous. This next question makes me sad for what happened, but they're wondering what your thoughts are. So our neighborhood has lost numerous trees from the mature forest. These areas now look like a tree cemetery. We also have several large trees, mostly oaks and hickory. Arborists want to soil drench or spray the trunks. Your thoughts? Wow. Uh, I assume they are, there. there's some insect, they believe that in, insects are killing the trunks. So they want to spray for the insect. Would you agree with that, Rachel? Yeah, I think so. I know that there's some issues there in some parts of the country. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, uh, I, I've been lucky. I haven't um, had to deal with that problem yet. Uh, and I'm a big fan of woodpeckers. I know this may sound flip, but uh, so, so I actually um, like to have dead trees around, but I know losing lots of high value trees uh, is a very scary situation. Um, whew, um, it, it does seem like uh, those chemicals are gonna kill a lot of things, but, um, but it could be that that might be uh, economically, uh, financially uh, important for, for the landowner. Uh, Ray, do you have any comments? Uh, yeah, I think I would just have questions about the situation. <laughs> we had to, we've got ash borer, emerald ash borer has just moved into our area and that's been um, really tough, really tough decision of whether to treat or cut um, trees down. So yeah, I, I'm a little confused if it's just one tree species or um, many trees. Yeah, several people have mentioned um, this is kind of going on in their area as well. 
So we do have time for um, one more question. And Ray, there's one, Ray with a Y. You mentioned you wanted to answer it specifically. Let me find it here. Is about the passion flower vine um, that a, a gardener said that it's traveled all over their yard and it grows over taller plants and rustles them to the ground. <laughs> Yes, um, I, I don't have an easy answer to this. I'm dealing with this uh, uh, as we speak. Um, I'm hoping in my case that the, that the Gulf Fritillaries uh, come here, arrive here in great abundance, lay a lot of eggs, and the caterpillars eat them all up. That's what happened to me two years ago. I had vast quantities of vines, a passion flower, and they all got skeletonized by the caterpillars. I had over 200 large caterpillars eating these, and, and that was my goal. Uh, if, on the other hand, it really gets crazy, uh, you could just pu pull these guys out. If you, if you get too many of these vines, pull them out. They're gonna re-sprout, but you're gonna weaken them by pulling them out. Uh, you could use an herbicide as a last resort, and I, I, I don't know what herbicide, we're not allowed to recommend herbicides. Uh, any specific herbicides, but um, I'm sure there are herbicides that would work on it, but just pulling them out is going to weaken them enough uh, so that it'll be tougher for them to continue to expand. Okay, I lied. We're going to ask one more question specifically because the person brought it up again and I want to, I want to honor that. Um, it's at the Mount Cuba Center in Delaware does research on um, native ours, which shows they have very similar benefits to pollinators and can thrive in sites where straight species may struggle. What with climate change, et cetera. Any comments on that? Yeah, I, I just, uh, I was about to type an answer to, to, uh, to Stephanie on that, but I'm so glad to get to answer it live. Um, I just discovered uh, that the website of Mount Cuba Center this past week and indeed found some research showing uh, that some of these native ours are doing just fine for pollinators. So um, uh, yes, uh, you, visit, you know, the, the research is going on on this topic right now. Uh, most of the native ours haven't been studied yet, but I do suggest for people in the Eastern US if they're interested in learning more about specific native ours to, to do a search for Mount Cuba Center and try to learn about their research. Um, and, and feel free to experiment on your own property. So I do have a few native ours and I'm keeping a close eye on them um, be, be, because sometimes I can't find the native species and the native R uh, is what's available at the store. Uh, but if I find that the native R is not attracting pollinators, uh, I'm gonna get rid of it. But uh, Stephanie, thanks for letting folks know about the Mount Cuba Center and their, their important research on native ours. I think our caution with native ours is just there's so much that's unknown. So it's awesome when there are native our species that we know are providing equal or even better um, benefits for pollinators and work in a landscape. Um, so if you know and the research is out there, that's great. Um, there are some um, bred qualities that we know um, haven't been very successful and also maintaining those benefits for pollinators. Um, I believe leaf color. So if something is bred to have a different leaf color, a lot of times it doesn't have equal benefits. Um, and then that, that double petal is another one. Uh, those are the two I can think of right away. Um, there's a lot of active research going on on native ours um, and, and their benefits to pollinators and other insects. Um, but the reason that we do caution or, or kind of recommend straight native species is because we just don't have that huge base of knowledge for all of them out there. All right, well, that is time. Thank you so much, both of you, both Rays, for just your wealth of knowledge. And this presentation was wonderful. Our next webinar in this series is managing the pests in your garden, which is always a very hot topic. And that will be August 6th at 10 a.m. Pacific um, Standard Time. And we will have two of our best experts on staff talking about how you can control um, pests in your yard without using pesticides and different alternatives. I know people always have questions on pesticides. So if you have questions, definitely join that webinar. You can register through our website, which is xerces.org. So if you have time, please fill out that evaluation that will pop up. And again, thank you for joining us today. And thank you both so much.
um, Ray and Ray for taking the time to do this presentation. Yeah, so happy to see all of you online. Thanks, Rachel, for all your help. It was a great pleasure and uh, I hope you get to go outside and, and, and go gardening soon.